Ливии. Can Brethel Diving After Scuba Cause Decompression Sickness? By Peter De Noble. Recreational divers sometimes practice scuba as well as breath hold diving on the same day. Some are concerned that breath hold diving after scuba may increase the risk of decompression sickness. Their worry is that repeated descents and ascents might change the ultimate destination of the venous gas emboli or bubbles that are possibly present in their blood after scuba diving and make them more likely to suffer decompression sickness. Another reason for their concern is the possibility that breath holding produces a buildup of inert gas nitrogen on top of that which remained in the body after scuba diving, which creates conditions that may be more likely to lead to decompression sickness. But is decompression sickness feasible in breath hold diving at all? Modeling the risk of decompression sickness after free diving in humans has provided theoretical situations in which decompression sickness could occur after single short surface intervals. Modeling the risk for decompression sickness after free diving in humans has provided theoretical scenarios in which decompression sickness can occur after single extreme dives, but the mechanisms that cause decompression sickness seem unlikely in breath hold diving. Cumulative effects of many repeated dives with short surface intervals that would increase the chances of venous gas emboli, but so far there have been very few reports. Some argue that decompression sickness in breath hold diving may be different than in scuba diving and that it may occur even without venous gas emboli. Decompression sickness-like symptoms have certainly been reported in breath hold divers. Symptoms of brain affliction have been observed in extreme divers by harvesters, spearfishermen, scooter users and free divers when they do repeated deep dives. Decompression sickness is one possible cause of these symptoms, but there might also be others like oxygen depletion, brain bleeding due to the extreme changes in blood pressure with breath hold diving, arterial gas embolism potentially caused by lung damage at depth, repeated micro-injuries of the brain, and various other potential factors. Pre-existing medical conditions, like small vessel disease, could also be involved. Regardless of whether breath hold diving produces venous gas emboli by itself, the concern that breath hold diving after scuba may cause the redistribution of those bubbles certainly is a small risk. But, despite uncertainties, neurological accidents in extreme breath hold diving have occurred and cannot be dismissed. So is the occurrence of decompression sickness in breath hold diving a real risk? We asked a couple of experts for their opinion. Robert Wong. Decompression sickness seems to be a real risk, but only in extreme breath hold diving. Clinical signs and symptoms have been observed in competitive divers, commercial sea harvesters of Japan, like the Amar divers, recreational spear fishermen of Australia and Spain, and in the pearl divers, symptoms never appear on the first day of the diving week for the Amar divers, and symptoms occur only after diving for at least 3.5 to 4 hours to depths in excess of 66 feet or 20 meters when the surface interval is shorter than the dive time. This does suggest nitrogen accumulation as being a contributing factor. Venous gas bubbles have been detected in Japanese Amar divers by Kolshi in 2010 as well as in breath hold divers performing a series of dives to depths of 154 feet, that is in excess of 40 meters, despite breathing oxygen for decompression, reported by Carl Huggins. Obviously detection of bubbles as such does not imply the occurrence of decompression sickness, but the possibility then exists. A patent for Amna Vale may have been a contributing factor in the case of the diver who made between 10 and 12 dives to depths of 33 to 60 feet, that's 9 to 18 meters, each of which last 60 to 120 seconds with a surface interval of five to six minutes. Two hours after the last dive, he experienced dizziness, visual disturbance, chest tightness, and numbness in the right side of the face. It appears that the diver had made sufficient dives to produce venous gas emboli, which may then have caused symptoms because of a PFO. Neil Pollock. 
There are anecdotal and retrospective data in the literature that are consistent with a diagnosis of decompression sickness. A recent attempt to model the risk found that it was negligible for divers at depths less than 330 feet, that's 100 meters, then rising as a function of exposure depth until the depth was sufficient for airway collapse to limit gas uptake from the lung, so possibly in the range of 755 feet or close to 200 meters. The magnitude of the hazard is unclear, but the absolute risk is probably very low for most freedivers, particularly when conservative service times are observed between dives. So does breath hold diving after scuba diving increase the risk of decompression sickness? Robert Wong. Breath hold diving after scuba diving may increase the risk of decompression sickness, but the evidence is scarce. A classic case was reported by Paul F who experienced nausea, dizziness, belching, hip and knee pain, weakness, paresthesia, and blurred vision after performing repetitive breath hold dives to 66 feet for five hours. His breath hold dives were preceded by hyperbaric exposure as chamber attendant for eight minutes at 66 feet or 20 meters. Three similar cases of decompression sickness have been reported after dives were performed to pressure in a hyperbaric chamber before breath hold diving. Neil Pollock. Compressed gas diving prior to free diving certainly increases the theoretical risk. High tissue concentrations of inert gas after compressed gas dives could make the impact of free diving more important. While no experimental evidence exists, bubbles produced following compressed gas dives could migrate to more sensitive tissues when transiently compressed by the free dive. Similarly, the physiological stress of free diving could enhance pulmonary shunting in other words, blood forcing its way through the lungs in a way that would not allow bubbles to be filtered out. And this could potentially increase the risk and frequency of bubbles entering the arterial circulation. The hazard might be greatest in the first part of the free dive when both bubble size and physical effort would be relatively high, or at the end of the free dive, if augmented shunting continued. Again though, there is no evidence of these factors causing injury. Studying a relatively rare event like decompression sickness in this context is very difficult. Studying a second rare event on top of the first is even harder. What is the nature of neurological symptoms reported in these breath hold divers? Robert Wong. The symptoms after breath hold dives appear to affect the central nervous system more readily than other areas of the body and often include vertigo, nausea, vomiting, paresthesia, muscle weakness and paralysis. Others include impaired concentration, lethargy, speech disturbance and even altered levels of consciousness. Musculoskeletal pain or joint pain appears uncommon. Neil Pollock. A key feature of the neurological symptoms reported by freedivers is its transient nature. This could be consistent with the lower gas loads associated with free diving exposures and the faster compression and decompression rates that they experience. It is tempting to think that we understand decompression hazards based on the wealth of compressed gas diving data, but this data includes little in terms of high descent and ascent rates, which can be in the order of six feet per second for free divers. What is the risk of neurological accidents in breath hold diving and how can it be mitigated? Robert Wong. The common factors causing neurological symptoms include breath hold dives in excess of 66 feet or 20 meters, repetitive dives over the course of three hours or more, and short surface intervals. If time is spent at depth, then more than double the time should be spent on the surface. Even a series of repetitive dives lasting less than three hours could risk decompression sickness. So to avoid an increased risk, breath hold divers should limit the number of repetitive dives and keep the surface interval times greater than the dive time. Neil Pollock. Neurological compromise in free diving may result from hypoxic loss of consciousness or decompression induced insults, but also various other problems. So a whole battery of strategies should be employed to reduce the hazard First, free divers must understand the limit of pre-dive hyperventilation. 
It works to extend breath hold time, but can completely remove normal protections against loss of consciousness. Free divers should also employ defensive weighting, establishing empty lung neutral buoyancy at 16 feet or deeper with deeper dives, so that if they were to lose consciousness, they would naturally drift back to the surface. There should also be adequate supervision to address incidents where loss of consciousness occurs during ascent. Direct supervision by a partner or more than one partner should be maintained throughout a breath hold dive and for at least 30 seconds after the dive to ensure stable consciousness is maintained. The complexity of support increases with dive depth and then there are other complications such as low visibility. Automatic servicing devices have the potential to reduce the life risk under a range of conditions. The risk of decompression sickness is also reduced by separating free diving and compressed gas diving by maintaining a minimum surface interval between the dives. Surface intervals should start at twice the duration of the dive time and increase as a function of the exposure depth. Neil Pollock, PhD, is a diving research scientist. Robert Wong, MD, is Medical Director of the Department of Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine at Fremantle in Australia.